films today tend to be complicated in both of its visual and literary aspects. There are films that intend to puzzle the viewers' minds from start to finish, then pull off an unexpected twist that is set to blow our minds. Other recent films try to be provocative as much as possible in order to expose the injustices deeply scattered within our society and inspire rage towards the culprits of such injustices. With the advent of streaming services, it is so easy to access a wide catalog of such films, from the comfort of your home, even from the palm of your hand. And on the creative side, the production of film with grand ambitions has never been easier with the aid of our exceptionally progressing technology. However, since a wide amount of titles are being released every month, the audience's attention quickly shifts from one title to another. At this age, where you can watch films almost anywhere, anytime, it has never been this easy to be distracted and forget about the films you've watched, no matter how complex, provocative, and new they are. But there is one film that I am certain would burrow its own place on your memory, or even make a mark on your heart. For it is, while mildly mind-blowing and provocative, never forgets to appeal to its audience's heart. And this film came from the year, drumroll please, 1942. This is Casablanca. Get a bowl of your favorite chips as we discuss your favorite flick here in Flick and Chips. Today, we are going to talk about Casablanca, a 1942 romantic drama film that surpassed the endurance of time, and it's one major key to its success, good old excellent writing. First released in the Hollywood Theater on November 26, 1942, Casablanca, directed by Michael Curtis, is a romantic drama film that follows the story of a tough outside but soft inside American expatriate, Rick, who owns a saloon in the Vicky-controlled city of Casablanca, a city where refugees of the war tries to gamble for their exit visas in order to escape to America. Rick's past lover, Ilsa, along with her husband, Victor, a Czech-resistant leader against the Third Reich, happen to go to Casablanca and leave Europe as well to further lead the resistance. Now, how did this film with a simple plot become a classic? One of the greatest strengths of Casablanca lies in clarity. Sure, it wasn't shot in 4K, it was even black and white. However, each shot and scene gives us a clear intention of what to feel, or gives us a clear idea on what the characters might be thinking. There is no facial close-up wasted in this film. And while most of the dialogues aren't delivered in a straightforward manner, but often in a poetic or rhetorical description, it is clear to us why a character is saying a line, and each line is said with clear intention that effectively creates tension. Casablanca's dialogue is full of wit, humorous and memorable. But aside from pizzazz, each line contributes to the depth of the story. Casablanca's plot certainly and effectively creates a conflict that grips the audience's attention from start to finish. The setting, the city of Casablanca, was beautifully established from the beginning of the film by focusing on several vignettes of Casablanca citizens. Take for example this part of the opening sequence. A man whose documents expired ran away and was shot by the police, only to recover an exit visa on his dead body. What tragedy it is to be shot dead for being an undocumented refugee when he is about to leave Casablanca, right? But then, it quickly cuts to the hall of the Justice's building entrance, where the motto Liberty, Egalite, Fraternite, or Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity is written. Even minute, flashing, establishing shots adds layer in portraying what kind of place Casablanca is. And to further amplify that, the following exchange of dialogue adds another layer to that irony. Unfortunately, along with these unhappy refugees, the scum of Europe has gravitated to Casablanca. Some of them have been waiting years for a visa. I beg of you, monsieur, watch yourself. Be on guard. This place is full of vultures, vultures everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Not at all. Au revoir, monsieur. Au revoir, madame. Au revoir. <laughs> The sequence that followed happened in Rick's saloon, where other citizens of Casablanca were shown, before finally focusing on our protagonist. This kind of setup is so great and important, 
especially when writing a story that is set in a specific place, in order to set the audience's expectation about the film as well as hook them from the start. However, even when it's clear to us what kind of place Casablanca is, we are welcomed by Rick's cynicism and we are made to get used to it. We are introduced to Rick's rules in his saloon, like how he doesn't drink with his customers and he doesn't put the bill on his tab. With this comes the effectiveness of Captain Reynolds' character. Like us, the audiences, Reynolds is eager to know what the real deal is about Rick. And like us, he suspects that Rick is, deep inside, a sentimentalist. This assumption, of course, was proven to be true later in the film. Yet, it is earned when the conflict develops further. When Rick found out that Ilsa, his past lover, was with Victor and was the reason she did not go with Rick when escaping Paris, Rick was torn apart. Rick holds the future of the resistance in his hands as he has the transit letter needed in order for Victor and Ilsa to escape. So, he was forced to choose between his principles and being with Ilsa. With such a conflict, many of us could sympathize, as we are often put in a situation where we need to choose between our personal interest and the immediate greater good. There is an old saying, everything is fair between love and war. Yet, love and war seems to be unfair for our protagonist, Rick. He can never be with Ilsa because war is in progress. With the whole world crumbling, we pick this time to fall in love. Yeah, it's pretty bad timing. Ilsa needs to go with Victor, the one she truly loves, to further spread the resistance against the Third Reich. I love you so much. And I hate this war so much. At first, it is clear to us that Rick doesn't want Elsa to leave as he's still clinging to their past. He was selfish and almost wanted Victor to fail. One woman has hurt you and you take your revenge on the rest of the world. You're a, you're a coward and weakly. But when he realized that Elsa was willing to sacrifice herself to Rick to let Victor escape to Lisbon, Rick's heart softened. He was convinced to also fight for the greater good. And so, the film suggests that in order for us to progress, we must denounce neutrality and side against the oppressor. And that sometimes, our greatest oppressor is ourself, our past. At the beginning of the film, we are much like Captain Reynolds. We do not know what side we are on. We are like following the wind. But in the end, as Captain Reynolds saw the courage and conviction of Rick towards his principles, he was also encouraged to defend his friend Rick and defend his country as well. This echoes to the scene where the Vicky sings their anthem in Rick's saloon, only to be overpowered by all the people singing La Marseillaise. We just need to hear the voices of the people near us before we start singing the same tune we truly believe in. And so, a beautiful friendship could start. Welp, that's all we could chip in for the flick we discussed today. As always, like and subscribe if you loved this video. And stay tuned for more film discussions only here in Flick and Chips.